The perfect wonder kid. It's an elusive idea. You have to have the knowledge of what makes a perfect wonder kid to diagnose that they have that potential. And then once you have them, you have to nurture them to the top before they can be the next message. Or you can just watch this video because we've assembled a crack team of training investigators that have spent months assessing how to properly develop players, testing things we had never thought to test before so that you can go into Football Manager with confidence that you are doing everything to develop that one guy with five-star potential that you are convinced will be great. But we start with maybe the most important part of this whole equation. What is more important? Playing matches or training and at what age is what in poor how important is it at an age of age you understand what i mean and this is something we've tested before but with the evolution of football manager we wanted to test it again and we had some different takeaways our crack team of training gurus put together some teams that were identical filled with identical players in every single facet and then subjected them to a couple of different scenarios the first one being basic in-game training and playing 20 to 30 matches a season the second one the players are suspended the whole year so they just train the third one they play the matches but they don't train and the fourth one they do nothing kind of a control group now obviously playing matches and training was the fastest developing but what it did help point out for us is that players develop in three segmented rates and this is incredibly important to keep in mind it's illustrated by this beautiful table on the left you see the age and the current ability growth of the players and as you go right you can see their development in the attributes that you're looking at year over year if it's green it's going up and you'll notice quickly looking at this there are two shells the first shelf is in the year 19 to 20 season, when a player stops its incredible development and enters into a phase of pretty solid development. And the next shelf is actually way later than you might have thought. It's the year 26 to 27 season. That is where discernible development for all intents and purposes stops completely. So what we found off the bat is that your players do actually have a lot more time to develop than you would think, but their explosive development phase ends as they become 20 years old. But that's still really good improvement all the way up to the age of 26. As for the second scenario where they're not playing match and just training, there was basically no player growth after the age of 21. So a lot of the growth that you see from the players from the age of 21 to the age of 26 is brought about almost entirely from playing in matches themselves. The effect that no training had, say if you're playing some sort of semi-pro save, this is your actual reality, was even worse. By the time players turn 19, they essentially stopped developing. And after the age of 23, they actively got worse. One thing that's important to take away from this first of many tests is something that can actually help you diagnose very high potential. Players current ability, if it's farther away from their potential ability, will develop faster. For example, if you have two 18-year-old players, both with a current ability or CA rating of 100, but the first one has a potential ability or PA rating of 140, and the second one has a PA rating of 180, the latter will grow a lot faster than the former, even if the two players are exposed to the exact same condition. So if you see a player improving very, very, very quickly relative to other players, that player has a lot bigger gap between their current ability and their potential ability. Now, obviously there can be quick growth spurts with players, but if this is something you see over a longer period of time, that a player is developing at just a faster rate, they've got a longer way to go. But enough with the initial test. Let's get into the stuff that's really gonna make a difference. Like NordVPN. You know them, you love them. They've sponsored this channel for a long time and they keep a lot of you safe on the internet. But if you don't know what NordVPN is, Allow me to help you. NordVPN is a fantastic VPN service, a virtual private network that allows you to route your internet traffic through a different point in the world, allowing it to be much more protected from people trying to cause mayhem. You click a drop down and you can beam yourself all over the world. If you travel a lot like I do, trying to make videos for you people, then you can beam yourself, for example, back to the United States so that you can watch the Netflix shows you wanted to watch without having to worry about what Netflix has on the channels in England, for example. Or if I'm staying 
staying at a hotel. And that might be a bit of a dangerous network to use for, let's say, banking or communicating with my editors in code. I can route my internet traffic through a NordVPN point somewhere else in the world to keep it much more safe. The best part is it's actually financially a great deal because there is a deal at the top of the description. You can get an exclusive deal plus four months free and a 30 day money back guarantee if somehow you find a drop down menu a little too confusing to operate. But if you wanna be safe on the internet, you can use the longtime trusted sponsor of this channel, NordVPN, to do it. And with a great new deal down in the description. And while that is something that can make a difference, the other thing that might make a difference for your wonder kid is how many matches they're actually supposed to play. This is a question I get asked all the time. So of course our training gurus were on it. Now the training team set up a battery of tests, running teams in zero matches a season up to 60 matches in a season. We discovered something amazing. Obviously zero matches is pretty bad for development. We already know that. One to three matches, negligible development. By the time a player is playing 10 to 15 matches, matches in a season, there is a significant increase in their development, but it's not quite the sweet spot. The sweet spot for player development is 20 to 30 matches a season, and it is striking. Player development was actually much better in 20 to 30 matches a season than in 41 to 50 matches a season. And after 50 matches a season, there wasn't really a significant regression. So if you want to pedri it and play 72 and you're already past 40, just let it rip. Now the actual reason for this is up for debate, and I've been debating it with the training team. But what we can't dispute are the facts that 20 to 30 matches a season are the best for development. Now this could be caused by SI instituting some sort of match experience cap where you can only gain so much development experience from matches. So if you're playing any more matches past 30, you're just losing out on opportunities to train, which is the other way you can max out your development. There's also the chance that more and more matches can lead to injuries, which obviously lead to you missing match and training time. But it's likely a combination of all three of those potential options. Playing more matches means you're training less. There is only so much match experience you can gain, and if you play in more matches, you're more likely to get hurt. So that fantastic teenager, as long as they're playing 20 to 30 matches a season, will be maxing out their development. But what exactly counts as a match? Pick friendly matches, for example. Do they help? Well, the training team ran that test too. And it turns out friendly matches do have a positive impact on the development of players 23 and under. But once you hit 24, there is no discernible positive impact on player development from friendly matches. So they don't count quite as much, but actually they do. One type of friendly match in particular, the intra-squad friendly. In an amazingly weird twist, intra-squad friendlies lead to more player development than actual friendly. And then you can multiply that by two because you're offering that development to the team that you're playing against, your U23s, your reserves, your U18s. Based off these findings, our training team wrote, you can make a case for filling up your entire preseason with intra-squad friendlies against your own reserve teams. You'll lose out on potential money made from friendlies against bigger clubs, but if you have a very young team and especially a very good youth team as well, it can really help development. But back to the idea of matches played. What about a substitute appearance? Well, this is hard to test, but the training team was able to test substitutions at 45 minutes and substitutions at 70 minutes. And there is one massive takeaway right away. Substitutions at 70 minutes are worse than not playing the match at all. The player misses out on a day of training and those last 20 minutes are not important enough to make up for it. Now the players that subbed in at halftime did develop more than players that didn't play at all, but it actually wasn't a ton. But if you wanna offer some developmental experience to a player, say that you wanted them on the bench for tactical reasons, but then you take a three nil lead, make sure you get them on the field before the 70th minute if you wanna have a positive developmental impact. And then the final question in this round of tests, does winning matches matter? The short answer is, no. The number of wins or losses for a particular team over the course of a season had no correlation with the development of players at all. If you're winning or losing, as long as the player's playing and training, they're doing what they can to develop. You're still losing. But now what attributes and conditions affect player development outside of what we've already talked about? Well, there are of course the hidden attributes of ambition and professionalism that are so often focused on and the unhidden attribute of determination, which I may have focused on in the past. And our takeaways from testing these can be summed up as follows. As long as you're at 10 to 
determination or ambition as an outfield player, that's basically going to give you all the developmental positives that you can get. If you have one determination or ambition, that's a problem, but as long as you're at 10, you're getting what you need. The higher a player's professionalism, the better they develop. Unsurprisingly, professionalism reigns supreme among the hidden attributes as the best contributor to player development. In a rather strange turn of events, if we zoom this table out a little bit, goalkeepers actually benefited more from ambition. All the way up to 20 ambition will add to the goalkeeper's development. I have no idea why. Determination works the same though. So is professionalism, obviously. But what about the more niche things, like natural fitness? An attribute that supposedly is supposed to keep you from deteriorating as you age. And what was a bit of a weird find is that natural fitness didn't matter at all, not just for player development, but like for anything. At least in terms of what we thought it mattered for, what it says in the game that it matters for. You see, there was no discernible difference in player decline based off the player's natural fitness. Past the age of 30, no matter their natural fitness, they declined at the same rate. There was a small subset that did decline slower with high natural fitness, and those were goalkeepers, and that was only when they got past the age of 38 did natural fitness factor in. But the natural fitness of a player had no bearing on their development or decline outside of 39-year-old goalkeepers. Look at you, Jean Luigi. How about the quality of the coaching staff and the training facilities? Things I obsess over all the time. They make a difference but not a major one. The best development was obviously with perfect coaches and facilities. With middling coaches and facilities, there was, as our team described, a little bit less growth. And then of course, if all of them were terrible, there was a lot less growth. As long as you have pretty good coaches and facilities, you're doing most of what you can. Next up is training intensity. The higher intensity, the better players develop. Direct correlation, very simple equation here. It also increases injury risk and fatigue, of course, but if you have a younger player having them on auto double training intensity is just going to have them develop more. Then there's league reputation. Something I've long speculated on, but we've never really confirmed is true. The higher a league's reputation, the better a player develops, regardless of the level of the players that they're actually playing against. It just comes from their league reputation. This means when you're loaning a player out, it is almost always the best option if they don't have adaptability issues to loan them to the highest reputation league you can get your hands on that will play them at least 20 to 30 matches in a season. Then there's the question of loans. Come on, I'd already mentioned loans once without singing. You knew it was coming. Unfortunately, they don't matter at all, which is why I could say that previous sentence with confidence. If you loan a player out in the same league with the same reputation and facilities, there is absolutely no difference in the player's development. And the only thing that could contribute to that would be worse facilities, worse reputation, and adaptability issues moving to an area that speaks a different language. And then a question that I didn't even think to ask, but is very relevant for a lot of people that don't invest in a super computer to play football manager like I do. If you want to watch football manager in HD, tune into the Twitch streams. You can see this baby hum. It's actually quite loud and heats up my room a lot. But if you're loaning out to inactive leagues all the time, I have some incredibly weird news for you. That's actually better. Reputation and facilities and all those things being the same, loaning a player out to an inactive league is the best option. Amazingly. If you loan them out to a view only league, that's still better than loaning them out to a playable league. Literally, it is the inverse order than you would think. You should actually target loaning players out to high reputation, good facility, non-playable teams. Especially if adaptability is not a concern. Like say you just signed somebody from Japan, you could loan them back there. It would actually be a good thing. Now up next, we have one of the most common questions I get asked and I never had an answer until now. What freaking youth team should you put your players in? Then the answer is absolutely conclusive. Development is best at all times with the exception of exclusively 15 year old goalkeepers in the senior team. Even with everything being equal, no matter the age of the player, being in, training in, and playing in the senior team is the best for development. Now as for the difference between reserve teams, U23 teams, U18 teams, there's not much of one. I mean, they all subscribe to this channel, so how bad could they be really? But they don't develop at the same rate as players that are in the senior team. And you might be thinking, well, that's the reputation 
reputation of the lower league. No, it's not. We actually even set the reputation of like the U18 league, the highest it could go in the game and development in the senior team, still higher. The difference is bigger than we observed in a controlled setting because those leagues are always worse. If a player's got a chance to be a real world star, get them into the senior team. But this could create a very complex scenario where maybe that player isn't good enough to get a lot of matches with your senior team yet. So maybe you want to make them available for youth team matches. This is still better than just having them in the youth team to begin with. So if you have a player that's supposed to be great and can't get a ton of matches with the senior team, having them play with the reserves but train with the senior team is the better solution. Keep in mind this does make them miss training time though, so maybe don't make them available for every U21 league game. Then there's the actual training itself. Of course you should have the player training a position, even if it's one they already know perfectly, that is just better for player development all the time. But what about this little section? additional focus. Well, I have some fantastic news. They work exactly how we thought they did. We tested all the additional focuses you could possibly test, and almost all of them produced the exact result we anticipated. They improved what we were focusing on at a slight expense to the things that we weren't focusing on. So you don't need an additional focus, but if you recognize that your player needs a significant focus on improvement in a particular area, then it's something you should tick on. Say you have a winger who's actually just a bit slow for your liking, then you're gonna want to funnel a bit more of their ability development into their speed. Or a midfielder that's just not quite good enough at passing, or a striker that doesn't have the touch or finishing that you require. To figure this out, we used a control group with no additional focus, and then a group with the additional focus focus on and found that in all but four additional focuses, what you were focusing on gained 0.2 or more more of that attribute. If you look at this table, everything that is in green gained more than the baseline without an additional focus. So in this table that highlights this particular attribute, you can see that we are having gains relative to the norm in that particular attribute at the slight expense of other attributes development. Those other attributes aren't getting worse, they're just not developing as much. This was true for everybody in the two first development phases up to the age of 27. At the age of 28, we did observe a weird phenomena I just want to tell you about. The agility and balance additional focus. Even for older players, it cooks. Look at those gains. These are for players that aren't in a development window that we found out was a development window in our earlier testing. And it doesn't come at the expense of a lot of other attributes. This is just like a free gain of agility and balance that you can get on older players. I guess it's never too late to train your balance. But the overall point is use additional focus if you want to funnel player development into a particular area. Don't use it if you don't. Now that you know what to do with your wonder kid, if you want to figure out what hidden attributes your wonder kid or potential potential wonder kid has before signing them or after they come through your youth intake, we do have a website linked down in the description that allows you to plug in all of the information you have about them and spits back to you the potential ranges of things like professionalism and ambition. And as you might have noticed by now, our training team has assembled all of these results into something of a research paper. Now, I don't know where I'm gonna host it quite yet, but by the time you're watching this, I will have hosted it. And the entirety of the papers I was referencing for this video will be down in the description for your own perusal, containing a lot of information I wasn't even able to get to that could still be helpful for your player development needs. So happy football managering and go raise those wonder kids. And when you do, send them to me. We have a section in the Discord for rating wonder kids and it is full of players that make me incredibly jealous of how unlucky I am with my freaking youth intake. <laughs>